<laughs> All right, so um, trying to start this new thing when I can uh, of, of doing a, a like map verse uh, a verse every week or dissect it. Polly's recommendation. So this week uh, kind of relates to last week's, and we talked about the Mosaic Law and God's Law and how we're now under the law of Christ, if you want to call it that. So um, this week it's Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you uh, and learn from me, which is important. For my, my, uh, I am lonely and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit, because actually this is going to be, it just so happened to work out this way, that this is going to be very much related to our discussion today. So the, the Greek word for yoke is zugos, zugos, a yoke put on cattle, metaphorically used of any burden or bondage. So when they plow the fields or whatever, they'd have this wooden bar that go across the uh, the cattle that would be pulling the cart or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, they would share the load. And if they had a, a younger calf or bull or whatever that was they were training, um, obviously the much larger and more experienced of the animals would take most of the weight and pull most of it and kind of guide the other one. Okay. So in the context of this verse, because it's always important that we, we use the context when we first uh, try to verse map a verse, is that the Pharisees of their time during the days of Jesus were using the law or oral traditions to lay a heavy burden on the shoulders of the people, even using as much as 613 regulations, most of them directed toward the Sabbath day. God made this the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath, but they kind of perverted it and and uh, reversed it for their own corruption. So, again, the law of Christ is the yoke being referred to here. You can call it the law of Christ. It is a yoke to bear, or as Jesus puts it, a cross to carry. Carry your cross and follow me. And we must receive it and put it on when we come to Christ. We must come to him as disciples to learn from him, to learn and be guided by him, like an older, more experienced bull guides the younger Half or whatever, all right? So that is something to notice is that uh, when you come to Christ and you follow Christ, it is it is a yoke. You're still putting on a yoke, all right? It's not like you become a Christian. You're like, oh, I can do whatever I want now. Well, I mean, if you're really a Christian, you wouldn't think that way. I mean, you can backslide and you're still saved, but because you're saved, you're justified when you come to Christ. But a lot of people have this in mind that, oh, I can go on and keep on sinning now that I've come to Christ. And is that really a yoke that you put on them? Did you really have faith in him if that's the case? So it is a yoke to wear. It is a cross to carry. But it's easy and light, Jesus says, for he is gentle and lowly in heart. Right? He bears our burdens in return for the yoke that we put on. His righteousness replaces our yoke of self-righteousness. Instead of working to, to accomplish and fulfill the law ourselves by doing good works, which we can't, Jesus did it for us. His perfect obedience to the law imputed through us by faith in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 So the yoke we bear in Christ is a yoke of repentance and faith followed by a singular commitment to follow Him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. All right. Obviously, we're not perfect. We're going to drop our cross. But the righteous man or woman drops his or her cross 12 times a day and picks it back up and keeps on walking. Right. So when you throw it, and you're like, all right, I'm done. All right. Now we got a problem. Perseverance is important. If at any time your soul isn't finding rest in Jesus, there's something wrong. There's something wrong there. It could be demonic oppression. Christians can't be possessed, but they can be oppressed. Okay? It could be weak faith. Regardless of what it is, pray and ask Him for His help. That's what He wants. Read His words. So we cannot earn our salvation through the heavy yoke of good works or keeping Old Testament law, but by the grace of God, Jesus fulfilled overbearing Old Testament law for us. He does the work in us for our sanctification, our growth in Him. And we're going to talk a lot about that during today's lesson. So that word yoke is, is repeated in Acts with Luke, Luke writing Acts. Now therefore, and this is actually Peter talking, so Luke is quoting Peter 
And the context is they were arguing over circumcision in the law of the Old Testament. And so Peter says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Okay? So some of this will come up in today's lesson. Just awesome how that works out. And I guess the bottom line here is there's nothing you should do other than lean more on Christ. Okay? Matthew 18, something, 18.3. That's going to be like the underlying theme of today's lesson, leaning more on Christ. So this is actually verse 2. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of, of them and said, this is the words of Jesus, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that, that I mean, it's always a little when you hear Jesus speak like that, like not entering the kingdom of heaven, oh no. It's actually pretty comforting if you understand it. Unless we are like children, and like children lean on their parents, they hold my hand, guide me in what's right, you know, I rely on you for everything kind of mentality, we will not enter the kingdom of God. So just lean more on Christ. Sounds simple enough. Not isn't always, but... So last week, we discussed the first 10 verses of John 2. We didn't get through 11 and 12, but we'll pick it up there in the next slide. So just a quick brief recap of last week. Jesus, his mother, and the disciples went to a wedding in Cana. And over the course of the wedding, maybe perhaps day three, the wine ran out, and Jesus' mother, Mary, knowing the ministry of Jesus was starting because he had just begun to gather his disciples and they were at the wedding, she went to Jesus for a solution. And, and as we discussed last week, might likely a miracle, even though we came to the conclusion through, I believe, the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had never done miracles before because, as we'll discuss in a couple verses here, the Bible says that, but our discussion with Tom and Trish and others, we came to the conclusion that if Jesus had done other miracles, like healing the skinned-up knee of his brothers, they wouldn't have such lack of faith that they showed later on in the, in, in the Scriptures, okay? So Jesus responds to Mary saying, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And this unveiled a new paradigm between the two in their relationship, from mother and son to Mary and the Messiah. And ultimately, Jesus can do nothing outside of his Father's will. His Father's will must be done. That is his will, to do his Father's will. So we can reasonably assume that Jesus went and prayed to the Father asking for his blessing, which obviously he got because then Jesus converts the water that uh, is in six ceremonial stone, stone jars into wine, which that's the that's the mashal, right? That's the the parable. A parable is an elongated mashal, a story or so. This actually happened, but it's kind of like the demonstration in the in the physical that spiritually foreshadows the day the blood of Jesus would replace Jewish ritual, and that's the nimshal. Okay, the day the blood of Jesus would replace Jewish rit ritual by converting water into wine. And that's the kind of work that he does in our bodies as well, in our, in our spirits, in our souls. And now where we're going to pick it up today is only the servants who trusted and obeyed got to witness Jesus' first miracle. They stood beside him while he did it. We can deduce that from the scriptures. All right, so now we're picking it up where we left off in John 2, verse 11. So this turning water into wine, the first of his signs, there it is, the first miracle Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory. And the disciples believed in him. So the servants are the ones that got to see Jesus' first sign, or you call it miracle. Although his disciples were at the wedding to taste it and know it happened. And apparently the wine tasted really good. All right, said the uh, wedding planner, or whatever you call him, the master of the feast. So the Greek word for manifested is phanerao which means to bring forth, appear, show, make evident. So this is an obvious indication of Jesus' hidden or surrendered glory when he became a man, that he humbled himself and gave some of that up. It's, uh, it's evidence of his holy nature as God in the flesh. However, you know the, the, the belief of the disciples is deepening here. Their, their faith is deepening, and Jesus as the Messiah, or the Anointed One, the Chosen One, the Son of God, you could say prophet of prophets and foretold king of Israel. And the thing is, in the Old Testament, there was a distinction there. You had the king, did the kingly duties. 
and the prophets did the prophet duties and the priests did the priesthood. The king doesn't do, do the prophet duties and the prophets aren't kings, but here the Messiah was expected to be the first to do both, king and prophet. All right, that's what kind of sets them apart from the others. But did the disciples, even though their faith was deepening, did they truly have a heart that believed Jesus to be Lord God, King of the universe, as all their prayers began? In other words, was he God? And by all accounts, Scripture suggests later on that no, they did not yet, even though they saw this miracle, they still did not have the faith to believe that he was God. Okay? Even Moses turned water into blood. All right? I think it was Elisha who even raised people from the dead. So, I mean, you can kind of understand as they were living in the moment uh, why they might not believe. But obviously, as we kind of discussed last week, it was after Jesus' Jesus's, um, ascension, or not ascension, resurrection, that they, they started connecting the dots and they figured it out. So next verse, John chapter 2, verse 12. After this, after this wedding, he went to Capernaum, or Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So after this miracle, he re- relocates his family in his ministry, really from Nazareth to Capernaum to set up, set up the headquarters for his ministry. So the word that I, I want to focus on here is brothers. <laughs> Last week, you guys kind of ripped on Catholics a little bit, all right? I was just a witness. <laughs> they did, all right? No. Um, <laughs> since this was supposed to be last week, we're continuing that a little bit. So there's a warning closet Catholics, okay? Lock the doors. Here we go. So Catholics believe, if you don't know this, that Mary was a virgin from birth all the way to her death. That uh, she never had relations. She was always a virgin. And she, the only child she had was Jesus. But again, this is man-made religion that isn't necessary. All right? Uh, for, so, for example, here, brothers, the Greek word used is adelphos. And it doesn't imply cousins, as the Catholics like to dance around the word and say it implies cousins. It actually means brothers. And we know this from other places in the text, but also in Matthew chapter 13, verse 56, it tells us that Jesus also had sisters. But by this point, they may have been married off, okay? Um, we just don't know for sure. But the word they use for sisters in Matthew 13, 56 is Adelphi, which is pretty close to Adelphos because it's brother and sister, not cousins, okay? Again, whenever you bring up an, a topic like this, Catholics have their way of dancing around it. But that's what they have to do. They have to use exegesis. They have to read. They have to read into it instead of reading out of what it really says. Exegesis. So to be clear, Mary had other children. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter one twenty four through twenty five is. I mean, I don't know how you dance around this one, but let's make them dance. Here we go. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, that would be Mary, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Knew her not is the key phrase there. That means they had relations after Jesus was born, right? And then had as many as seven children, scholars believe that includes Jesus, all right? And here's another interesting ironic thing is that in the culture of their time with the Hebrews and the Jews and Mary, and as we've already discussed in this class, having children is seen as a blessing, right? It's not a command, but it's a blessing to have children. And in her day, that was definitely more so the case. Uh, so by saying Mary didn't have any children and she stayed a virgin, you know, Roman Catholics tend to worship Mary. Some of them actually literally do, of the ones I've spoken to. It's kind of ironic that they try to make the claim that Mary remained a virgin when really that's pretty insulting for her culture. <laughs> so, so that's just a little irony going on there. So now we're going to uh, pick it up with chapter 2, verses 13 through 25, and finish out the reading of this chapter. So if you'd like, you can turn your Bible out or just read off the screen. It's on their, on their sheet. And also, Polly hooked you guys up with a sheet. Okay, Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who sold the pigeons, 
Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Okay. Verses 13 through 14, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. So a little historical context here. Jewish law required every family to offer their own sacrificial animal at Passover. You can read that in the Pentateuch or the Torah. Um, but here's the thing. Distant out-of-towners would need to purchase animals at the temple because who wants to drag a goat or sheep you know, across Israel? Sounds like a chore. All right. So they would just purchase them their sacrifices there. But Matthew chapter 21 informs us that the high priests or the high prices were a scam to extort money from them. All right. They were charging exuberant fees. It was a ripoff, right? The money changers were there because everyone who attended Passover had to pay a temple tax equivalent to two days' wages, right? So they were all getting taxed by Rome, but they were definitely getting taxed by these priests as well, by the Sanhedrin. And all temple purchases or taxes had to be paid with a special temple coin which, of course, the money changers charge exorbitant, exorbitant fees for. So if you had, I don't know, one denarius coin, all right, you wanted to trade that in, they would charge you to trade that in for a temple coin just so you could pay your taxes and stuff. Man, it's like stabbing them in the back and twisting that knife. All right, thank you. All right, so it is also possible that as many as 2.25 million Jews sometimes assembled in Jerusalem to keep the Passover. Do the math in your head like Tom's doing right now. That's a lot of coin, okay? <laughs> He's shaking his head. Like, yep, <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> so obviously, that's a lot of coin. Passover became a big business. And this big business became familiar. It became the way of doing things, all right? Were, they ha were the Jewish people happy about it? Probably not. What are they going to do about it, you know? Sin has a way of creeping in like that, of establishing a foothold and taking over. It's, it's just the normal way of doing things now, all right? Until... Jesus from Nazareth gets on the scene, ruins their party. And what we're still about all this is that this was all going on in the court of the Gentiles, which was preventing them from worshiping. All right. Not only were they stabbing them in the back, they were like stabbing God in the back, right? Keeping Gentiles from worshiping like that. So, making a whip of cords, Jesus drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturn their tables. So this is what people tend to think of when, you know, people, a lot of like liberal Protestants like to say, I like the, the God of the Old Te or the New Testament. I like Jesus. I don't really care much for that God of the Old Testament because he did really hard things, all right? It's the same God. <laughs> but a lot of people, myself included, like to use this first, you know, when, when liberal Protestants start saying things like that, we're like, Jesus overturned tables, okay? But we'll continue this conversation in, in verse 17 with uh, unrighteous anger versus, versus righteous indignation, which is what Jesus had here. One thing that just came to my mind when I read this was, it was kind of, you can call it ironic, how Jesus whipped them for their sins. And some people think that Jesus was whipping just the oxen, getting them out. Others think that he was whipping the actual <laughs> priests and stuff. I would like to think it was both, if not more so the priests. <laughs> So he was whipping them for their sin, but he too would later be whipped for their sin. All right. Anybody have anything they want to add to that? That's as far as I got. Yeah. It's my understanding that many of most of the Jews brought their own lamb and they were declared imperfect by nitpicking and that they would take those lambs and put them in a pen 
and sell them a very expensive one, then magically as the day went on, that lamb would be healed and they would sell it for an exorbitant price. And it was just a ongoing game with them to make more money. It's a total scam. Yeah. I did not know that part. That's pretty interesting. Follow the money. <laughs> Follow mammon. It leads you to hell. Here we go. So, he drove them all out. God did not want these evil people in his presence. He drove them out with the sheep and the oxen. He didn't even want their sacrifices. And remember, our underlying topic since our very beginning together is the end will be like the beginning. In our study of John here, the Alpha will be like the Omega, which makes total sense if you think about it because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the end of beginning. So, and God does not change, Malachi tells us. So it makes logical sense that the end will be like the beginning. So what I mean by this, what I'm getting at is, when Jesus came the first time, and, and you know, before 70 AD, around 30 AD, apostasy was rampant. That's what this is, apostasy. It's people who should know the truth, but then turn against it, right? Not just away from it, but just against it. Apostasy was rampant. When Jesus comes the second time, uh, at the close of the age, apostasy will once again be rampant, First Timothy 4 tells us. It's that history repeating itself in these spiritual patterns. It's Pesher. I have a question. Yes. What I'm curious as what your thoughts are on selling things in the church. Thank you. Because <laughs> apparently the Holy Spirit's everywhere, right? In the church I attend, that's I mean, we did a cookbook and we couldn't sell it. But everybody wanted to share the recipes, so they did allow us to cover the cost. But um, so many churches have rummage sales, you know, garage sales. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got your card? Can't yeah. say bingo if you don't have your card. <laughs> that that I didn't have to worry about. But what are your thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of new to this church here, so I'm not. And you're right on target. There's a brand new policy that. It's going to be that has been written and we've looked at. It's now gone to EC. That is, a, if you want to do a fundraiser, so to speak, at DBC, there are some procedures. At this point, the qualification rules, whatever you want, are go, have gone from stewardship. They're now at EC. What's so that's EC? being addressed she might have to at the executive council. Okay. Okay. So at this point, that's where it is. It left Sunday from us after uh, Jason worked on it and moved. The mm -hmm. education executive council. I just thought it was interesting because you know Jesus said this is a house of worship. This is not a marketplace. So a lot of churches do that, and so like I, the spaghetti dinners, things like that, and the proceeds go to, proceeds to whatever project is going on in the church. And there have been no guidelines yeah. to this point for BBC. There are at this point <laughs> in the in the works. Trish, but. More to the point, as far as I'm concerned, is not fundraisers, but the churches. And we've been to some very nice, wonderful preachers that have bookstores in there. Not right there in the hallway, but to me, that's not honoring where you worship. Okay. She said, yeah, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Listen, the last thing you want is for me to be the interpreter, all right? I'll start screaming. Okay. Well, it's interesting this actually came up because we might have answers later on in this lesson. I never thought it would lead us in that direction, but that's... Thank you, Mom. John. Instead of charging... I would think there could be the possibility of giving donations yes. Yes. Uh, yes. beyond uh, the tithe, which would be just acceptable. Yeah, that's a good point. So donations, and don't forget, you know, on the opposite side of that coin, you know, and the the epistles tell us we should reimburse like our pastors and stuff like that. So, yeah, most churches are designated as five hundred one c three organizations, which are for not for profit so if you have a bookstore and you're making a lot of money just to build up whoever's the authors are or something like that then that would be inappropriate under a 501c3 
but if they are turning it back into um, things that are good for the church, for yeah. good for the edification of the people, then our laws allow it. All right. It's a little bit different than what the Pharisees were doing because they were building up their own coffee. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they were doing that for God or Jesus wouldn't have whipped them. <laughs> I would like to comment to Tom that we really have to be very, very, very careful what the government does because it's totally corrupt and they have <laughs> defined the church uh, as, as Satan. I mean, Satan has a church and they, they, they have a complete deviation of what a church is. So I think as a church body, the church body has to be consistent with the Bible and not with what the federal government puts out in type of any regulations for the church. I agree, John. I agree that the government has its own corruption and everything. But fortunately, people early on in our government wrote laws to protect churches, to build up things like libraries. Uh, teachers are allowed to do a certain amount of copying for their classes that would violate copyright laws under other circumstances. So our founding fathers were really wise, I think guided by the Holy Spirit, to make laws that protected the church and protected educational institutions. And uh, we need to hang on to those things as much as we can, because if we lose them, we're going to lose a lot. Should we get the lawyer in on this? Do we, are you just burning to say something, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> well, what we need to get in here is JD, all right? This is, <laughs> I feel useless right now. <laughs> no, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what you guys have to say later on in this lesson if we get there, all right? Anyway, what were we talking about? Uh, okay, so the end will be like the beginning, apostasy in this time with Jesus' first coming, apostasy at his second coming. And we talked about last this week or last week how when Jesus speaks of the end times or the close of the age, he relates it in the rapture and a lot. He relates it to a, a traditional Galilean wedding. And the bridegroom literally comes in the middle of the night to get his bride to be and come live with them. He comes in the middle of the night. Jesus said over and over again, the bridegroom will come like a thief in the night. That is while it's dark. When you have apostasy, when you have people who are blind to the truth and persecuting and evil and all this stuff, Holly, you have the revelation? Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. All right. Nobody wants that. Okay. In the beginning, the end will be like the beginning. Jesus separated light from darkness. In the end, Jesus will separate the wheat from the tares and the sheep from the goats. And honestly, I was thinking about this the last couple of weeks. It's like it already, it's already starting to happen. He's already, that separating is already going on. Uh, people are falling away. Uh, not to name names, but Candace Owens just converted to Catholicism. Like, yeah, not to name names, but here's a name. <laughs> it's like you can, you can start seeing this whole separation going on, but at the end of the tribulation, it will literally happen. We'll have a, a light from darkness event. All right, so verse 16, And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So John's gospel begins with a, a miracle conversion, the water to wine at the wedding of Cana, then moves directly to a work of cleansing here with the cleansing of the temple. And this order is how Jesus always works in people. And pigeons were sold to the poor because, you know, a lot of them couldn't afford a lamb for sacrifice. I'm sure the pigeons themselves were, were sold for a heavy fee, okay? Leviticus 5.7 tells us that. And you can, what you can take from this is that no matter how little a believer has or owns, he or she always has something to, to be thankful for and even give to God. Even if you have no money, you can give them your time. All right? uh, it's that whole widow with the two pennies thing. Giving her two pennies. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So we spoke about the Babylonian spirit before, um, basically the spirit of the age, the, the metaphysical people would call it the zeitgeist. It's, it's when the dispersion at Babylon happened, that evil wickedness spread out throughout the world, all right, made its way into Eastern Asia and, and India, which then during the Crusades, the those soldiers picked up like counting, bead counting and stuff, and that made its way into Roman Catholicism. It's like it was its own like uh, judgment for doing that. But 
The Babylonian spirit has taken root in the hearts of man in place of God in this temple, what's going on right now. They are worshiping man's way of doing things by making it this market, a house of trade, a worship of mammon, a worship of money, a worship of humanity. Again, their way of doing things. And if it's in place of Christ, it is the Antichrist. It's a, as John says, it's a, 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 a form of Antichrist. Many Antichrists are, in the, are out there. And Satan is always the puppet, puppet master behind the Antichrist. Okay? This history repeats itself until its fulfillment at the close of the age with Babylon the Great. Remember, it will be a, a, a system. It will be a, a, a political government with false religion. But also there's an economic side to it. And that's how you get the mark of the beast and 666 and all that. All right, those who do not denounce their faith in Christ will not get, be able to trade and stuff like that. So here you can see that spiritual pattern of history recapitulating. So, verse 17, Jesus' disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So this is a reference to Psalm 69.9. That's literally what it says there that Paul writes. The word for zeal is, or zeal is zealous, passionate, excitement, or fervor of spirit. In this context, it's like an intense jealousy. Righteous, intense jealousy. So again, in context, the literal meaning is David wrote this verse in Psalm 69 because he was being persecuted for his faith in Jesus or in, in God and very much wanted God to prevail against the wicked people who were coming against him. And I use a capital H for him because really against those who are coming against God. Uh, David saw himself as a, of, of a man of God. He just wanted to do God's will. So if they are coming after, after David, they're coming after God. So really he had an intense jealousy for God in this regard. And the deeper meaning behind it still is that God's Spirit obviously wrote this through David. And the Spirit, what it was implying or intended here, was it was prophetic. It was uh, prophetically writing through David in light of Jesus' future clearing of the temple, which is why John here mentions back to it. So God's Spirit, the same Spirit that was in David, that's in Jesus because he was already baptized at this point, had the same zeal in both situations. Jesus, like David, felt intense jealousy on the behalf of God when those around him were acting against him. Again, capital H, against God, and you could say against Jesus. This righteous indignation pleased God when it was demonstrated through, I think, I don't know how you pronounce it, but fine has, that's how we would pronounce it in English, uh, in Numbers chapter 25. I mentioned this before a couple weeks ago, but let's read it together. And then if you have any comments, the floor is all yours. All right. Numbers 25, 1 through 11 here. So this is when Israel, you know, they, they know what they're supposed to do. They know right and wrong to a certain extent. They, they're getting God's law, but then this Baal, this ball worship makes its way in. So verse tw or chapter 25, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Here we go. So Israel yoked, we talked about yoked earlier, yoked themselves or himself to Baal of Peor. And this anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses, in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. And the Lord said to Moses, Fine Hass, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. All right, it's that righteous indignation on behalf of God. So a general rule of thumb, a lesson you can learn from this is uh, anger is sin when it stems from personal pride. But it's righteous indignation when you're angry because you're angry on behalf of God like Finehouse was. I'm not, don't stab anybody, but right, 
we're all clear on that. Um, I have a question as I'm reading the, the Bible for the year and I'm in the Old Testament and thousands and thousands of people keep getting killed. Um, does anybody have an explanation? <laughs> um, uh, you know, it seems terrible. And I don't know, um, 10,000 are killed here and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. Anybody want to chime in before I say anything? Right. Like it goes back to that whole, I don't like the God of the Old Testament as much as I like the God of the New Testament. Well, we've spoken about several times throughout the last few weeks of God has a way of, God reveals more of himself over time. And we're going to talk about that today, about how you grow in the knowledge that spiritual growth. That's just the way he works. Like when he, at the burning bush, when he revealed his name to Moses, they, they didn't have that before, but then he just revealed something huge about God. And that was the first thing I was led to when I was doing my own personal study of God is just learn his name. And now, man, something was unlocked when I learned that. And I learned so much just from that, Polly. God, God was cleansing. Yeah. Remember, God's a teacher. He was he, all this stuff from Genesis 1 1 is, is to teach. Even, he even had us in mind at this time. This is all for it's a, it's a teaching lesson, okay? Uh, in part, yeah. Well, you think he's killing off tens of thousands of people, men, women, and children. And even today, he's not necessarily doing that. We're still, we're still, we never learned the lesson through the mass murder of individuals. Right. So. Right. All right. I'm sure this will come up again. Anybody else have something they want to say? Okay. 18 through 21. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So the Jews, which is in reference to actually religious leaders, if you really dig into that word, they don't just mean carte blanche, all the Jews. The religious leaders of the Sanhedrin asked Jesus for proof, or through a sign or a miracle, of his God-given authority to wreck the outer court of the temple where they were doing these things, which in a way is a half-honest request, but we'll address that here in a little bit. So Jesus, as God does, answers in a profound way that the wicked would have no chance of truly understanding, All right, blinded by their own wickedness, self-righteousness. The Jews thought Jesus was saying, I will destroy this physical temple here in Jerusalem and prove my authority by rebuilding it in three days. That will be your sign. And w w the reason they responded this way, like, oh, you're going to raise in three days, it, you know, it's taken 46 years, is because from Josephus, the secular historian, we know that when the temple, when these, re uh, when these reno renovations were complete, at one time, 18,000 men were basically laid off. Oh, that's a lot of manpower almost a half century of work, and they're like, you're going to do it in three days by yourself? All right, let me get a lawn chair. i got to see this. <laughs> but what Jesus was actually saying was, you will kill my body, but in three days I will bring it back to life. This will be a sign of my authority. And Jesus, as Yahweh, Old Testament, as I am, what that really means is he's self-existent. His life depends on nothing because he is life. He is Zoe, so he could do this. Jesus could do this. And if you look into it in the New Testament, you'll see and you'll learn that all three members of the Trinity were involved in raising Jesus from the dead. So there's some verses for you to read. God is one God and three persons. All were involved. Jesus signaling that he was now the temple in which God lives among men, and he still is. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. So then, Paul writes, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Old Testament, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And this very act of temple cleansing that Jesus is doing, ironically enough, was actually the sign that these Jews were looking for but were too blind to see. And that's in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, obviously speaking of John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, 
and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Lord of hosts. This was fulfilled in his first coming. But who can endure the day of his coming? Now speaking of second coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring uh, offerings and righteousness to the Lord. So, Pesher interpretation. This is both first coming and second coming. It's like a foreshadow of the refining he's going to do with the millennium here. If they would have known, this is what uh, that they, if their eyes were open, they would have known this is what they were looking for. This was the, the very sign itself was Jesus cleansing the temple. But again, they were blind to seeing it because of their wickedness. Paul, do you have Matthew 16, 4? The evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. All right. An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. Obviously, they're pretty evil. And we're going to talk about this here in a slide or two about that seeking a sign thing. But here, this is kind of expanded upon with Matthew 12 and what Jesus meant when he said, nothing but a sign of Jonah will be revealed to them. Um, so verse 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But Jesus answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So even in Jesus' response to them was like four-dimensional thinking. Like it's the sign of Jonah that he's very consistent about. I will raise up in three days the sign of Jonah. You'll see that sign, okay? Any comments or questions? Okay. No one's passed out yet. It's kind of hot in here, right? All right. When therefore he was raised from the... Uh, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he had said this. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So the disciples themselves only obtained this deeper understanding after the resurrection. Okay? But, they're, they, but they believed the scripture. They were starting to put two and two together a little bit. And the scripture they're referring to here is likely Psalm 16, verse 10, that was enhancing their beliefs, that was growing them in the spirit here. Psalm 16.10 is, For you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, and let your Holy One see corruption. So their faith increased with their knowledge of the truth. This is called spiritual growth, the process of becoming more like Jesus. We refer to it as sanctification. And even Jesus himself, having humbled himself, had to grow in wisdom, Luke 2.52 tells us. So the question for today, one of them, is how do we do this? How do we grow in our faith? Now I'm going to see if any of you really did pass out. How do we grow in our faith? Slowly. Slowly. <laughs> Very slow. It's a slow journey. What's that? I, I thought I heard something. Line upon line, principle upon principle. And you know, when Jesus talked about destroying this temple, I know that signs were abstract, but they were also traditional with the Jews, and maybe this was an abstraction. They just didn't have. You wouldn't talk to young children about the temple and mean anything but the building. Right. And so I don't, I wonder if it was their thought process level. Okay. John? I would say that the best way to, to, to consider growth in faith, how to grow in faith, is to put complete trust in God's Word and His wisdom. And that's the only guiding light. And anything else is going to distract us. Yep. Very good. Good answers, you guys. Yeah. Memorizing Scripture. Remember, that, that's Paul. Is he claimed that one? Faith comes, hearing, hearing by the word of God. faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. All right. I think we're on the right track here. So, we can get a really good answer from Second Peter Chapter 1, 3 through 8. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped 
from the corruption that is in the word or in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and vir virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness. Verse 7, and godliness with brotherly affection and brother brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and uh, are yours, you are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Simple answer, as you guys were getting at here, you guys said, through prayer and scripture, allowing Jesus to change us through the Holy Spirit. And you can also throw other things in there like fellowship, obviously. Uh, the verse above, 2 Peter suggests God gives us more as we prove ourselves committed to what he's already given us. And you can also kind of get that, glean that from the parable of the talents and ten min minus. I don't know. Um, you have something, Davey? I do. Yeah. All of these things are very important, but the Bible also tells us to put this in our heart. We can dissect that one by saying he's telling us to put it deep inside of us because things can take away our hearing our vision can go, our mind can go, but if it's deep in our heart, it will always stay there. And I know this because having worked in nursing homes, people who are not speaking, not hearing, not remembering, have a sister come up alongside them and start to sing a familiar hymn mm -hmm. that's in their heart, that comes out. So. We can talk about hearing and listening and talking, but it better be deep in your heart. That's a great point. Absolutely. Psalm 119, 11. <clears throat> but when my grandmother had a stroke, she could not talk. But if we sang hymns with her, she could uh, sing the words of the hymns. Wow. And someday we may not have the Bible. And so to have those scriptures memorized in your heart, is all you're going to have. Right. So, you know, they say eventually the Bible will be outlawed in other countries. It already is. Yeah. Yeah. I had a principal at the school I taught at that was got on that a lot because she even said, uh, you know, people like to use their phones or their iPads or whatever to as their Bible. Well, what happens if, uh, you know, an EMP or whatever is kind of extreme, but that's true. Like, what if you don't have that technology anymore? I got a verse that I'd like to. Second, what John said, uh, it's in Deuteronomy 8 and chapter 3. I won't read the whole thing, but that you make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. And of course, they just had the experience of being fed in the desert. But man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's right. He's the bread of life. Thank you, Jim, Dr. Jim. So... Exactly. So that brings us to this last bullet point here. This is also how we be overcome habitual sin. It has to be in your heart, all right? Obviously, habitual sin goes out the window when you become a Christian, but that does not mean we stop sinning. But if it's in your heart, if his word is in your heart, that leads through your actions because it's what you truly believe. It's deep down, all right? It's, it's leaning on Jesus, really. Really, the answer comes down to how do we grow in our faith? We have that truth in our heart. And that leads us to lean even harder on Jesus. Going back to our, our opening verse of the week, leaning more on Jesus first, all right? Not trying to do it in your own strength. Good, awesome. So we have time for at least one more slide here. I think these are the last verses of the chapter. So now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. And when they saw the signs that he was doing, uh, saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover feast now, and he did do signs and miracles for evidence of his divine authority, even though he didn't do the sign or whatever that the, uh, the, the priests wanted to see. But, now, but he did do them. So God knows it's not unreasonable that people at times need to see these signs or miracles to confirm the, his legitimacy, mostly while revealing more of himself in the early days of the Old Testament or Jesus with this new covenant in the New Testament. 
But a major problem, and this isn't just for our day, although it is a problem in our day, even a problem back then that we just saw in a few verses earlier, people want to God to prove his existence. You know, show me you are God, that you have this authority, without any effort at all to, to read the word he's given us. You know, they, don't, they won't even pray. Um, and this shows a lack of faith. You could call it a lack of trust and doesn't please God. Now, this is... This really led me into a, a, a deep study myself when I was preparing this lesson. And it's like, like, like it was when I was led to just learn what God's name is. That like unlocked so much for me in my brain. I feel like this unlocked quite a bit for me in regard to faith. Um, so let's have a quick, it's going to have to be quick because we got about five minutes, but we can always pick it up here next week if we want after you guys have time to think about this yourselves. How many of you have heard the phrase "put out a fleece" or "fleece praying"? You want to define I do it? it? You do it. I do it. Okay. I think I think once we all learn what it means, we've all done it, right? In fact, I probably used it as an example in here before, not knowing that's what it's called. Prayer. You want to explain what it is? Well, if you don't know what God wants you to do about something, then uh, you ask Him to show you, and um, sometimes the description there. He, the person had a specific request, I'll put the fleece out, and if it's, uh, it's wet and the ground is dry, and then the next work, either vice versa. But, but we can ask for more um, help and, and something that we should, uh, should do. So yeah, so, for, so this stems back from Judges and uh, Gideon, who wanted to make sure he was going to do God's will. Thing is, God, in the form of Jesus, uh, uh, um, pre-incarnate Jesus, the Christophany, already did a miracle to prove who he was to Gideon by like burning the sacrificial meat he put out before him. But then later Gideon's like, I just want to make sure, God, that I'm doing your will. So if it's if I'm in your will with what I'm going to do, put out this fleece. I'm going to put out this fleece before me and make it damp, as June was saying. And, the, and in the morning it was damp, but the ground was dry, just like he requested, and he wrung it out and it filled up a bowl. And then then, then it wasn't enough. He was like, okay, God, now, just to confirm that's really you, now make the ground damp and keep the fleece dry. So the exact opposite. And that was the case. And God, if you read these verses, you'll see God didn't get upset by it. Well, for instance, if you're wondering, does God want me to take this job? You might say, um, Lord, if uh, I'm offered such and so, I will know that this is meant to be. And if that doesn't happen, then I will think that you're answering uh, um, the other way. That was the exact example I was going to use. So if you, if you, if let's say you're in this conundrum and you're like, I don't know if I should take this job or not. Is this God's will? I read through the Bible. I just don't know God. So show, show me a sign or whatever. Open up the door. Or close the door if it's not supposed to happen. You know, just make it known to me that this is your will because I don't want to. I don't want to step outside your will. I think we've all prayed prayers like that before, right? Um, so I also want to look at here. Joshua 9.14. So I'm in Joshua now in my own personal study time, and it just so happens this is the verse I came across like the morning I started digging deep into this. <laughs> and it says like, in the context it was the Israelites under Joshua, they're invading Israel now. They crossed the Jordan, and yet one town or community that they were supposed to conquer, because they were supposed to kill everyone, right? One town came up and deceived them and said, we're actually foreigners from far away. You know, make us... A your servants make a covenant with us. So they did, but they didn't seek the counsel of God first to know that they were being deceived. And so the, the lesson I took from that is don't make such hasty decisions without seeking God's counsel. But then when I looked into this whole prayer fleecing and what Gideon did, you know, he, he wanted to know God's will. But from what I researched, a lot of theologians show that as a lack of faith because he kept wanting, he already had proof from Jesus and he, it just wasn't enough. He wanted, he wanted more evidence, more God proved to me this is your will. Like that's a that's some weak faith there that Gideon was showing. Ironically, we don't typically think of that when we think of Gideon. So, is it wrong to put out a fleece? Theologians and Bible scholars today, from what I've gathered, seem to think, yeah, it's wrong to do that. And that shocked me because we, I think we've all done that. Like God, show me your will. But the way they look at it is by depending so hard and not knowing what God's will is. It's like showing a lack of faith almost in some in some way and what i think is i, I don't really agree with either camp i kind of think it as 
context matters, right? So we shouldn't test God as Gideon did. You know, God shows us a sign, and yet we still have, a, in our lack of faith, we still want more just to keep proving it. But at the same time, if you're asking, you know, God, I have this job here. I don't know if it's what I should do. I've read through the scriptures. I've prayed on it. What do you want me to do? I honestly have no idea. But then you pray like, God, open up the door, close the door, but I'm going to take this job. And I'm just going to have the faith that no matter what decision I make, you will use it for your glory and your ultimate purpose. I think that shows a huge... Why would you use old covenant methods to communicate with a new covenant God? Exactly. Right. Exactly. In Psalms, it tells us that God speaks to us in our sleep. And when Tom and I would have a discussion and not be able to make a decision... He thinks like a man, and I think like a woman, and that's, you know, that's normal, you know? Is it? <laughs> but we would just agree that we would ask the Lord to show us, and in the morning, we would just agree. Whatever it was, the my thought would go away, or his thought would go away, or it would be totally new. But God does speak to you in your sleep, and he gives you really peace with decisions, and so we just learned to do that. Yeah. When God has a door open before you, you can trust him to either close the door or leave it open. And often if he closes the door, he opens a window and you find another <laughs> yeah. way where he wants you to go. I kind of go with Proverbs 3, uh, verses 5 and 6, which say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Exactly. So, thank you guys. Um, man, I could. I wanted to talk about this a lot more, but we can pick it up here next week. But I do want to read these verses before we go, just so you can give us all something to chew on. So I think it would be, I don't know if wrong is the right answer, but to just pray, God, I'm not making any decision until you show me what you want me to do. I think that shows a lack of faith. But if you say, you know, I'm... I, I trust in you no matter what decision I make. I know you're going to use it for, I think that, I think God appreciates that because that shows a stronger faith. But I want to read Romans 14, 23, and then 1 John 3, 21. And I want you guys to kind of chew on this. And then when we pick it up here next week, if you have anything you want to. Okay, you've added those notes, right? These are. You've added new ones. Yeah, yeah. So I have to get this out to Polly on Wednesday so she can get it for you guys. But. My study does not stop, so that's why it's different than what's in your notes, okay? Um, Romans 14, 23. But, whenever, or but whoever has doubts it's, is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever, not just eating, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin, right? That can be kind of a hard one to chew on, so just chew on that uh, if you want. But let's, let's end it with some really good news here in 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So it's that strong faith. Like, God, I don't, I don't, I, I tried my best. I read your word. I don't know what your will is for this point in my life, but I'm going to take this step of confidence, this step of faith, knowing that no matter which way you lead me, you got me. And you, the Bible says here in 1 John that if we come to it like that, we have confidence before God. Because if we pray that, now it's on him to actually steer us in the direction he wants us to go. If we pray, your will be done. I think another thing to remember is that God wants you to ask specifically for answers because he likes to answer things specifically. If you ask something that's wrong because you're asking it for the wrong motives, he tells us that he won't answer that. So yeah. you can't go wrong if, if you're looking to him. Thank you, Tom. That's actually something I wanted to touch on too. I just forgot. So our motives is everything. God does not look on, God looks on the heart of man, the Bible tells us. It's all about your, what's, what's driving you to this decision, right? Your motives behind it. So I used an example in this class before, and I apologize for going over, but this is important. Like when I was backsliding, I was so blinded. I was like, I want to get tattoo sleeves. So I made my appointment, but then before my appointment came around, God pulled me out of the backsliding and my eyes were opened a little bit more. 
but they weren't opened all the way because I was like, God, I don't know if you want me to do this, but close the door if you don't want me to. And like Gideon, two, he closed the door. I said, now confirm it for me. He did it again. But now looking back, my eyes are even more open now from this study. It's like, that's prayer fleecing. And knowing what I know now, what was my motivation for asking for that? Why did I want to get tattoo sleeves? That had nothing to do with God. I was backsliding. Had I known then, I would have known my answer. But God being faithful, even though I honestly sought, like Gideon honestly sought his will, he still showed it to me. But it would have been better had I just been like, all right, I, I know your word. I know this is not giving glory to you. So I got my answer. And this, it's, it's just timing. When I, I wish I could record when I'm like doing these lessons. It's just amazing, like how God leads me in these directions. Because early, earlier this week, I was thinking, what should I get Carrie for our 10 year anniversary in August? And I had an idea. It's not cheap, but. <laughs> And she doesn't know what it is, so I can't say what it is. So I was like, this is kind of substantial. God, I want you to close this door if you don't want me to do it. And that's what led me on this journey. And I, when I got to this point, as Tom was mentioning, I was like, what's my motivation behind this? I was like, well, I knew from the very beginning I wanted to please God by loving my wife, by doing this nice thing for her. It all stemmed back to me wanting to please God. So I was like, I'm going through with it. So <laughs> your anniversary is going to be awesome. <laughs> I said, we can take up an offer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Help me, I'm poor. <laughs> Before we close in prayer, I want to recognize the Skidmore family. Skidmore family. Yeah, a family faith. John, I can't remember the wife's name, but Joyce. John and Joyce. The Jays. Fantastic, faithful family. All right, thank you, John. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, anybody have anything else? We went ran a little over today. That's your fault, not mine. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for this discussion this morning. Uh, thank you for. Uh, growing us deeper in the knowledge of, of your son, Jesus, who is the truth. May we use it to glorify you as we go out into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.